Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we're going to be talking to Mr. Florian Fez, who is the co-founder of Slater. He's also the co-host of Slater Pod and has a tremendous amount of experience in the local industry. Florian, how are you today? I'm okay. I'm good. How are you, Mark? Pretty good. I should mention um, that what we're going to be talking to you about is we're going to be talking to you about um, marketing. And that's um, an, an area that you have um, a lot of expertise in, a lot of experience in. But before we do that, um, I guess, are you in Zurich right now? I am in Zurich. Uh, I've been here for the past 280 years. That would make you... Like that. That would make you definitely my uh, older brother. Okay, man. So <laughs> it must be that uh, that clean air, that clean water, and uh, yeah, because you don't Keeps look a healthy. day over 120, man. So <laughs> absolutely. Um, no, I've been. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here in Zurich. Yeah. So uh, I guess you're. That was like a COVID reference. So like you just that was feel a like COVID you can. Joke. Sorry. Okay. It's, a... uh, it's all right, man. No. Hey, um, I got to ask you. Uh, is fall starting there? The beautiful yep. fall colors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we had a terrible summer. Now, uh, slowly, kind of golden fall moving in. So, uh, feel feels good. It's nice, you know, getting ready for the ski season in like two months. So, all that's, good. That's awesome. And um, are you still doing uh, quite a bit of running? Uh, it, was, it was a lazy summer, but I hope to ramp it up again in 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 the fall. Yeah. Do you feel? Do you do your running before work or after? Uh before. Yeah. Do Do you feel it helps you? Yeah, massively. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't do anything in the, in the evening, so it's it's a lot of morning running. Yeah. That's awesome. It's inspiring because um, you know I, I see I see your uh, routes on Strava, and I'm like, okay, well if he's out there doing something, I better get off my butt and go do something. So. Yeah, and it's also it's a way to do to listen to podcasts. So I, you know I'm bo- both a producer and and more, much more kind of a listener to podcasts, and that's the only kind of time that actually that I have to really kind of focus on on, on good podcasts. So yeah, that's great, man. Hey, um, what, you know, you, out of all the people I know in this industry have probably one of the most diverse backgrounds in the context of look, I mean, you've worked in a variety of roles. Um, could you just maybe get set, you know, give an overview of the types of jobs that you've done in look? Of course. Yeah. So I started probably 20 years ago, like with a traditional translator university degree. Right. And then moved through that. Um, and then, um, went into a, a linguist role at a at a large uh, language service provider in Switzerland, then moved out to Asia uh, from Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, where I took over, you know, the the operational side first and then more the sales side and eventually kind of more the the, the managerial side, managing the region with, with 60 people before coming back and starting Slater. So that was really linguist, language operations, kind of sales management. And then with Slater now, it's it's... Of course, a lot of advisory work, content work, uh, you know, kind of more thirty thousand foot industry view type of work. So, yeah, it's been it's been quite broad. And when you mentioned marketing, and that's what we're going to talk about today, I I have no like uh, education in marketing, but I guess I'm a practitioner, right? And we're mm-hmm. we're a platform that marketers are using f- uh, for for running their campaigns partially. So. So that's my approach. It's very, very, very much hands-on and lacking any kind of formal education in it. So anybody who listens to this with a formal marketing education background, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing in advance. That's um, no, but it's impressive. I mean, one of the best ways to learn is actually do roll up your sleeves and get it done. And I think you know, having worked with you in some of those roles in Asia, that's what you had to do. I mean, you you moved into, for example, a vendor management role uh, with you know maybe no formal training, but you picked it up on the fly and and and, and did a great job. Um, and Likewise, in those subsequent roles, why don't we, in, in, in terms of, um, in order to set the stage as you were for the rest of this conversation, why don't you just give us a quick uh, introduction to what Slater actually does? I mean, I'm, I think some people are aware of some of the things you do, but maybe not everything. Sure. Yeah. So we have a, a number of like pillars, I guess you, you would call that. So we, we started out very much as a content business. So we published uh, and still publish a lot of free content around the industry. There's so much going on in the language localization industry and in the general kind of the tech side, machine translation, natural language processing. So we started out publishing one or two uh, high quality content pieces per day. 
right? Uh, we uh, then also moved into conferencing and now, of course, remote conferencing. Uh, we, you know, we publish a, a newsletter that goes out once a week. And I think we might want to touch on that later because it's a fantastic channel. Um, we, we do, be, before COVID, we did, a, and now online as well, we did a fair amount of like um, uh, kind of bespoke lead generation uh, events, like where you, you know, you gather people around a certain topic and then you have one dedicated sponsor to, to run that for you or we run it for them rather. Uh, and then uh, we do a lot of research and that's what we really ramped up over the past you know, two years where we uh, produce very high quality uh, in-depth research reports around 40 to 50, sometimes even 80 pages that people can, can access by either subscription or kind of pay as you go when they download it. And then personally, I do a bunch of advisory work now that's, that's been keeping me busy for the past 18 months, 12 months, very much uh, focused on advisory work. That's a, a, a lot of different activities and they all require yeah. some level of expertise. Um, you started off with content. You said one or two content pieces. And for you, that's probably obvious, you know, why you'd want to start with content. But maybe you can explain the strategy of publishing high quality content. And also, if you get a chance, maybe share some of the metrics in terms of number of subscribers. And I mean, however you judge your performance, et cetera. Yeah. So there's a few metrics we look at. One is web traffic, which is, you know, around 80 to 140,000 mon monthly pay choose. It really r depends on like, if you have like a breakout story that, you know, goes viral, uh, you know, so, some, so we had a few stories in the past two years that just kind of kept performing. So that's uh, what we look at web traffic. Um, also newsletter subscribers. So we have that weekly newsletter uh, that, you know, allows us to send people an email every week. And it's like triple opt-in by now, you make people a click, they're not a robot. <laughs> yes, I opt-in again with my Uber email. GDPR yeah. friendly, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you, but you want to do that because you, you don't want to get spammed by by MailChimp, which which just acquired, I, I read today for like $12 billion. So it seems like the newsletter, uh, email newsletter is still a good business. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so, yeah, so we have that newsletter. We're at 14,100 subscribers now. So that's that's quite a sizable um, uh newsletter audience and we, we have very healthy metrics uh usually when when you ramp up newsletter subscriber count like those metrics will go down like uh uh opening rates and click-throughs so we're still at like you know 30 35 percent opening and like 12 plus uh percent uh click rates right so this is this is these are very healthy metrics and our advertisers love that so you know it's it's a free newsletter there's some industry commentary in it and, and a lot of other things so uh yeah we're very happy with that and then in terms of other metrics, it's hard to say, but I mean, we, we try to publish uh, one research report every six to seven weeks. Uh, that's quite an ambitious um, plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you know, we did some hiring this year to, to keep that pace going. And then for the other parts of the business, like, like conferences, it's, it's conference turnout. I mean, usually we had about 100 uh, people at the in-person conference. And now with the remote, uh, we have about 300 plus. We just had a conference last week where we had 300. Uh, people online. And so those are roughly, roughly the numbers. Yeah. I'm going to come back to that in a second about how you've been able to transition from this pre COVID to post COVID um, situation with conferences. And I think you've done it in a very agile manner, uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Now let's, let's kind of dig into marketing. Okay. Um, and you know, marketing can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It could mean running an ad. It could be doing a AdWords campaign. It could be collateral. It could be events. From where you sit and in the context of the local industry, what are the, you know, top of mind activities and things that, that you think about when we talk about quote unquote marketing? Yeah, it's a good question. So again, I'm not like a a marketer with a formal education, so I can't kind of give the, you know, 10-step marketing breakdown. But I think in this industry, what makes it very challenging is that you're uh, targeting very specific customer segments, right? So if you're in life sciences, you need to, you know, obviously have a very different um, kind of messaging than when you're in banking or if you're in like enterprise localization or app localization or game localization, memo cues, you know, definitely very, very strong among all the game localization companies. Actually, we had uh, one of your happy clients at our conference last week from, from Riot Games. And, nice. uh, and, and so, I mean, marketing to a game crowd is, is very different than marketing to, to like investment bank. So that, that is a very challenging setup. 
Uh, and then, I mean, I would argue, and, and this is where Slater will come in, like you also need to make sure that you have a somewhat of, of a marketing and brand awareness among the actual industry, which may not be super obvious sometimes, but actually it, it, it is helpful also for, uh, for those language service providers. So on the one hand, you're talking to the industry. Uh, on the other hand, you need to uh, actually target your core customer segments, right? So how you do that, it, it really varies uh, depending on who, who you're trying to target. If you go, let's talk about maybe like, for example, banking, right? I mean, in pre-COVID, you would have to go to conferences and very actively network. But if they don't know you, if you have no zero brand recognition, that's going to be really tough, right? right. So you may want to sponsor like a forum um, to just get that name recognition up. Or then, of course, there's the whole SEO game, which I would also put under marketing, which is really, really challenging. And you have to really be super selective about what kind of keywords you'd buy because uh, uh, in translation, localization, the keywords are quite expensive, uh, the ones that perform. Uh, but then, yeah, so for example, for gaming, I mean, if you're targeting indie, indie game studios, that, that's, that would be a very, very different one. That's probably a much more online type of uh, lead gen process. So, um, yeah, I mean, it. Very varied and really depending on what channel you want to reach, the, the, the means you choose. Okay, well, can, you, can you give some um, success stories or examples of, of organizations? You don't have to name the organization. You could just you know, leave it as a generic low company or a tech company, et cetera. But successful efforts or campaigns that, that you've been impressed with. It's a good, let, let me name them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because probably those who know might might want to. Uh, they probably know. Um, they probably would would find out anyway. So I mean, just just a couple. Of, for example, Limebridge, it's quite large company, of course, right? So they did the complete reposition of the company uh, over the past uh, like two to three years. Revamped the entire website. Really kind of stripped bare their entire like yeah, the website and kind of build it up from scratch we actually had their cmo at our conference kind of walking through those individual steps and i really think it worked it kind of you know new logo new colors everything so um and and they have the challenge that they're servicing all of these industries so they're really going out with a very bespoke message for all of these individual uh industries they're serving so i think that's that was quite an impressive kind of cmo project uh then for example vista tech is, is a much smaller provider in terms of the, the revenue, but they have, for example, that Think Global series. So you, you, it's an award show in a sense, right? You're, you're giving award, you, you recognize leaders in the industry. Uh, you have these kind of conferences that bring um, uh, a lot of visibility to you. Uh, and then on, on the, the tech side, for example, SmartCat, they, they were the first to do the, um, the remote conferencing. Like while we were still trying to figure out how to do remote conferencing, this was our core business. Like they just started like this online conference and it, it kind of, you know, went almost viral, had a lot of people. Um, and then there's also, I recently saw that TMS provider actually partnering with a buyer for like free educational um, uh, kind of a course for, for end buyers. Right. Mm -hmm. And that generated like, it was like, it got, because the buyer then posted it, the lock buyer. So that got like 300 likes on, on LinkedIn. So you're partnering. And obviously that I would assume generates a lot of traction among, you know, those buyers and then signups. And, and so you give like free educational content to them. And then, you know, you guys do a good job. I mean, now you have a podcast and you had Memo Q Fest uh, earlier, like a couple of years ago, you did that regularly pre COVID and there was hundreds of people there. So. And we've got, uh, yeah, we've so got, we've some, got, we've got more to come. We've got more to come. Trust there me. You go. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you mentioned, um, uh, events, uh, some, some of the, some of the, sometimes some of the feedback I've heard from people who go to some of the big industry events, for example, is that it's, you know, typically it's all the same people. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how to, how to select an event? How to select an event? Um, Okay, so there's two there's two things, right? One is industry events, and we're part of that, and we're trying to make sure that um, at least on the speaker side, to always put an original lineup up with people that may not have spoken at previous events. Very very hard, right? I mean, a, a lot of people are very busy, and now it's a little easier with remote. But previously, they even had to travel in. Uh, how to select an event? Now, let's just talk about not the localization events, but like the the other events. Well, go where your decision makers are. Right. I so mean, for, if you're, you're talking about like industry, for example, life sciences or, or financial service, something like that. Correct. Yes. Okay. I mean, and I th now with, with remote, that should be possible too. I mean, all of these people, they're also going to, uh, to conferences, right? I mean, or sitting in front of their laptop or notebook <laughs> or whatever, uh, 
you know, a big screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go there. So you go to where your actual buyers are. And um, yeah. And if you're in, I, mean, I guess you're seeing all the same people that will be probably in the enterprise localization space, like the really top, you know, 100, 200 customers in localization. Yeah. I mean, they, they tend to go to big localization focused conferences. But again, if you go, if you're servicing any of these, um, these other verticals where maybe the spend isn't so large, uh, so these people wouldn't be at, at, a, at a law conference, they would maybe be at an investment banking operations conference or at a life science clinical trial forum, right? So you, you need to select those uh, and, and connect with people. Should be easier now. What, what advice would you give? Because I mean, you, you can kind of relate, from, uh, relate to this because you, you, know, you were a startup and built Slater. Uh, mm -hmm. What advice would you give for small, smaller uh, low companies that want to, you know, do marketing, but you can't do everything. You can't do events. You can't yeah. do and advertising and keywords and SEO and SEM and all the collateral. And, you know, so what advice, where would you, where would you start? I think you, even if you're small, you should have one person dedicated to this uh, and actually like a somewhat experienced person. So I don't think it's, a, I mean, unless you're like tiny, tiny, but like anybody with, you know, a couple million dollars, north of a couple million dollars should have somebody dedicated to marketing. Um, and, you know, understand uh, maybe not the exact details of maybe an SEO campaign, because that can get quite costly, but I mean, have a, have a good website. I mean, there's so many easy, uh, you know, kind of no code tools now to get, to get a good website up, make sure that it's SEO friendly, uh, you know, do, do a podcast. I mean, a podcast, you know, it can be done in a couple hours, if you have everything set up, I mean, it's, it's gotten a lot easier. Um, in terms of attending conferences, that's not super hard now if you can do it remote. Um, so yeah, and you, you need to focus a little bit. So maybe just see where you're strong at and where your clients are. I know that's a bit of a generic answer, but um, yeah. And maybe, let me pause for a second. If you're the CEO um, of one of those companies, you should definitely have a social media presence. I mean, be visible, comment actively, choose your channel. I mean, probably LinkedIn, even though Twitter is hating on LinkedIn, but I think actually for this industry, I think LinkedIn is a really good channel. And if you're, you know, if you actually provide good, interesting content, people will, you know, you will be visible. I mean, there's a few people like in this industry who run relatively small LSPs, but are quite, uh, quite visible online. So I, I would suggest that. Uh, okay. And that, that, that's the all great, great advice in terms of LinkedIn. I mean, you kind of touched on it, but maybe you can go a little bit farther. What advice or, or you know, best practices could you suggest for creating that LinkedIn, um, presence? Don't link that, that, <laughs> that the irony in LinkedIn is LinkedIn doesn't like if you link to other, uh, other articles. Like, so let me give you an example. Um, even when we publish amazing content and I link to it and then like it has this kind of image and, you know, you write a bit of additional comment to it. LinkedIn typically doesn't push this hard. If you post something that's native to LinkedIn, LinkedIn loves it. The algorithm loves it and, and boosts it quite, quite heavily. So to give an example, what we've done is we've started about three months ago to just summarize like all of the headlines that we uh, had from our coverage, but also from like we have a daily newsletter that kind of aggregates all of the smaller stories also. And I post that picture. It's literally a JPEG with probably about 70 or 80 headlines in. And that typically gets anywhere between 50 or 200 likes and kind of reshares. So like LinkedIn likes when you stay LinkedIn native. Uh, and also, I mean, when, when, just, to, when yeah. you say LinkedIn native, you mean that's some content that was originally published on LinkedIn as opposed <laughs> to means, something that's in the New York Times or, or in another publication? Na LinkedIn native meaning don't like, I mean, obviously you want to drive people to your website, right? So you have, I mean, there's, you, you can maybe every month you post like, you have 10 posts that eventually link, like they have a link back to your website. And if people click on it, they go to your website. But LinkedIn likes it when you just post a LinkedIn post that doesn't go anywhere. Like it doesn't make people, it doesn't link anywhere else. It's just, it's a LinkedIn post and that's all it is, you know? Right. Got you. Um, so it doesn't go anywhere else. And, and it's, yeah. So I think LinkedIn likes that. Plus, um, give insights there, like write 
two or three paragraphs um, that, that people find interesting, right? Not just like, hey, it's been an awesome week and, you know, it was great to see everyone, but actual maybe some like small analysis or like an anecdote or, or things like that. And I don't like people that over tag, like there's some people that just tag like 50 other people in one post and then it shows up as a notification. But if I see that I'm one of like 50 other people, am I going to really like the post? I don't know. So yeah, those are some uh, minor best practices. No, I like that. I like that. Um, I think, I think that I, and probably other people, sometimes we just post stuff, um, thinking that, well, we, we posted it and something magic's going to happen. And, um, more often than not, it doesn't. <laughs> so, um, go ahead. It's a sense. I mean, we got, we got now 21,000 or something, almost 22,000 followers on LinkedIn for Slater. I mean, that's six years of work, right? But it does help. I mean, uh, it, Absolutely. it does help. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you mentioned Twitter earlier. Uh, I've actually never used Twitter. I, okay, back up. I think I've created like three different accounts and then just never used them. Uh, mm. what, how do you use Twitter? Uh, I'm using it mostly for non loke stuff, actually, <laughs> uh, which is a little ironic. I think that, that the localization is just not super active on Twitter. Uh, there's, there's other industries that live completely on Twitter, like cryptocurrency stuff, for example. I mean, they, there's zero activity on LinkedIn and like everything's on, on Twitter. So there's some, there's some good accounts, uh, but mostly, yeah, it's mostly from the translator side, the linguist side. And, you know, there's people like, uh, I mean, some of the ATA, uh, people are, are quite active. There's some, there's some good accounts there, but, uh, yeah, for corporate, it's, it's quite, quite silent. Actually, so I'm I'm using it mostly for non loke things. I mean, we have like six, seven thousand followers on Twitter with with Slater, but yeah, it's. I think LinkedIn is way more efficient. Okay, and in terms of uh, you know growing Slater's business, what have been the the big marketing wins where you're like, oh my gosh, this is this is working. This is we're getting momentum here versus spending a couple thousand dollars on AdWords and you're like, eh, or I, you know, I'm just using that as an example. I have no idea, but yeah. It's a good question. Uh, it's, it's hard to pinpoint any single moment. I think it's just the consistency. Um, and, and so, yeah, maybe I, I say don't hope for like that major breakthrough because it's probably not going to come, but it's that the consistency is really it. If you just keep at it, if you blog, don't blog once a month and then forget it for half a year. Uh, just do it religiously twice a week. Have somebody do it. You know, make sure you, you cross your T's and dot your I's when it comes to SEO best practices, like, you know, having like the image has like all text and like you have these kind of meta descriptions uh, to the blog post, et cetera. If you do this consistently and keep at it for, you know, a few years, you're definitely going to see a good return on, on that kind of content marketing side of, of marketing. So I think that's, that's my one thing. I don't expect, I mean, and because in those just, in terms of the wins, you will have wins. Like we had an article, uh, for example, one about Netflix that just keeps performing up to this day. It's like three years old. And it's like you Google like tra Netflix and translation and that article is number one on Google, right? So does it have anything to do with like, like subtitles or Netflix translation? Like, no, obviously not. But it's just, there's so many people Googling Netflix and translation, they still go to that article. So, so you will have these types of kind of viral wins um, and uh, but you need to have quite a uh, an amount of content that you put out to to get those I, I've heard the same or read the same in terms of podcasts you know if you just do mm. one you know every other month no. or something like that it's not going to work I mean you do a really good job with Slater Pod. I, you put out what one episode a week or something one a week one a week <laughs> it's, it was it was uh, is yeah, there anything you know. don't do you know <laughs> no but that thing was uh yeah it was I love it. It's actually, it also keeps you on your toes in terms of in, like industry, like learning. I mean, for us, it's very important that we continue to like engage with the industry and learn from people, right? Because we're the ones that are also like helping other people's learn about the industry. So sometimes, you know, if you're too insular and you just focus on your report writing, you don't get to speak to, um, you don't really have your pulse too much on the industry, especially now that you can't go to conferences, right? So those podcasts really help. And if you're efficient, you don't need, it doesn't take too much time. And Swiss yeah. are very efficient. That's for sure. <laughs> very efficient. <laughs> no, you actually gave me some good advice on, on this. I mean, I've been doing my, uh, my cybersecurity podcast for about three or four years. And then I just had a couple conversations with you and learned some really cool new tricks. Um, speaking of which, 
what are your thoughts in terms of gig workers and their their uh, the opportunity to leverage their expertise if you are running marketing for it could be an LSP for it could be a technology company it could be yourself um, Slater gig workers as in like Upwork pe people in Crowd Upwork Spring, for example Upwork, or? yeah you know yeah. logos intros outros editing you know you tell me uh, that's a good question um, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that we have a digital producer at Slater, like full time. And that was one, one of the key hires we made last year. Um, so that, that really frees everyone's time up. I think you can go through uh, platforms like Upwork and uh, we have an account. We occasionally use it. Um, we, for example, have somebody producing the podcast, but that was sourced from a, from a tweet. Somebody asking for like yeah, efficient podcast producers. So Definitely something you can do, and especially on the design side, I think you you, sh you you can source quite good designers on on some of these platforms, and you know you don't want to do your logo yourself, etc. But uh, I, I don't have too much experience like running marketing ops via gig workers. I gotta say, yeah, it's okay. mostly an in-house job. And what are your thoughts? I mean, if you go to the CMO level for larger enterprises, uh, you know, obviously big data and AI are hugely important in terms of understanding consumer or customer behavior. Um, do you see any of that being applied in the local industry? Um, yeah, I think this is, this is a tough question. Um, big data and AI. I, I think it's probably in marketing on like, unless you go to like the really, really large companies where you have like millions of, you know, contacts and, and you can crunch your data and you can like build like fully automated that, like fully automated flows where like somebody signs up and they get, you know, the email in the first 24 hours, they get email X. And if they open it, they get e email Y and all these kind of complicated flows. Um, I, I don't see that uh, very much, especially for this industry so far. But um, I think if you go to the C level, again, I think the C level uh, leader should engage on a very personal note, actually, like on a personal level. Um, CMOs definitely, but also CEOs. Uh, I think a lot of people are still, and, and you see the younger kind of generation doing this a lot more and, and be a lot less shy about it, right? I understand like a, maybe a, a kind of a seasoned 60 year old, like executive wouldn't want to go in and go kind of get into a Twitter fight. But there's, <laughs> if, if, you, if you look at the kind of the, you know, the, the 30 year old, whatever uh, kind of startup CEOs. I mean, they're very direct. They're very on, they're very much on Twitter. They're very much on these social networks and uh, they, they kind of do a, a lot of the heavy lifting on, on, in terms of the, the marketing on their side. So uh, yeah, big data and AI, I don't have a, a very strong opinion on that. Probably it's going to come at some point. I, I haven't seen it very much. I mean, big data, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of contacts, I guess you're getting into big data already there, but um, nothing uh, fully automated yet. For me. So when you say that the CEO should engage, you're saying that they should be out there prob probably on LinkedIn, at industry events, um, whether they're in person or virtual or not, you know, in, in basically establishing a relationship, right? Putting a, a, a face to the name and uh, in, in, in putting a face to the, on the company, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, th again, there, I think the crypto scene is miles ahead of everyone else. I mean, at least from the industry that I, that I follow closely. I mean, there you have CEOs that have like, you know, half a million followers on, 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 on Twitter and like directly talk to, to their clients and obviously, and also to their investors. So yeah, I mean, they're basically a chief marketer number one and they wow. come across as very authentic and, uh, and they go to podcasts, they have some of their own podcasts. So they, they drive a lot of that themselves and they see it as kind of a, really a CEO level activity. And I Excellent. think you don't need to spend I mean, you don't need 40 hours a week on this. If you spend two or three hours at this type of activity and you're regularly on the, on, on the social media platforms, I think, I think you can get a lot of um, uh, recognition, like, yeah, visibility out of it. So for your, for your own marketing, and just to kind of keep abreast of, you know, develops in the, in, in the marketing space, where do you go uh, in terms of understanding what, what are some new tools or new techniques, et cetera? Um, so I subscribe to, I've gotten a lot into kind of the no code space, um, because I'm, I'm technically like a coding wise kind of illiterate, right? So I love all these new no code tools. So I would strongly recommend people to find like, uh, some, some no code newsletters, no code platforms. 
uh, cause there's, there's all of these SaaS tools that you can use to automate certain parts of your marketing, right? Software as a service tool. So I, I subscribe to that and I, uh, probably sign up to like one new SaaS tool a week and then like try it out and see if it works. And then, uh, you know, probably sign up to like paid versions of it, like once every quarter or something. So no code, definitely great. I love Twitter for that to just kind of, if you follow the right people, you get a lot of, um, uh, good, good info there and uh, can tips. So for example, this, uh, the, the Riverside tool, we're recording the podcast. I think I got this from a tweet from uh, Alexander Drexel, who's one of the, uh, who also has a podcast. So um, uh, Lock Industry Podcast. So, you know, I got that via Twitter. So I think Twitter is a very helpful uh, source of information. So you, if you're a marketer, just follow the top 200 marketers and you'll, you'll get a lot of good information there. Um, do, you, yeah. do you ever feel, do you ever feel uh, you know, in terms of Twitter or LinkedIn or any of the social channels, but do you ever feel overwhelmed with all the information? How do you filter it down? Hmm. I think I used to be more overwhelmed than I'm now. I think I've gotten quite comfortable just parsing through this and, you know, I have a little bit of a flow, like I sign up for something, I put it in one kind of folder on, on my browser. And then if I, you know, I just channel it through. So, yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of stuff out there, but, you know, you, as a marketer, you don't want to be, you don't want to end up on the wrong platform. And then like everybody else is using platform X and you're like, why are they so efficient? Well, that's because you have. 20 clicks to do one activity while the other guy has some kind of AI that, you know, probably filters and pre-selects all, all of the contents automatically. So we had an experience like that with our sales tool, right? We were on one platform and they didn't innovate for five years. And then we're like, well, Ouch. you know, maybe should, we should use, choose another one. We used the other one. And now we're like, I'm almost looking forward to logging into that one. And <laughs> it's super efficient. So yeah, no, I'm, I don't think I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I like it. That's great. Um, just a couple more questions and, uh, we, you kind of touched on this already, but, um, uh, marketing pre COVID versus post COVID. I mean, you guys have really pivoted, uh, in, ter in terms of your virtual events. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen and what you're doing? So for us, the, I mean, and for everyone, I think the, the, by far the biggest change on the marketing side was just, yeah, that the events side just moved completely online and like, and then what online? I mean, like there's some tools that try to kind of recreate the experience with like, you know, you see like a, um, like a conference room and then you sit on like a virtual table, for example, um, to me that sometimes looks a little clumsy. Then there's other platforms. One that we use is, is called Hopin, which like raised a trillion dollars or something like half a year ago. And you can sense it now the product's getting quite, quite good. Uh, so that that was the the biggest change like how do you uh on how do you run a successful online event and i think now people are starting to figure this out and uh, this is going to stay because you know you can get so many more people into a virtual event than you can that you'd ever hope to get into a real event right from different parts of the world etc uh so for us it's been a it's been a tremendously successful transition. I mean, I, you know, I was very skeptical first, but now we've done four virtual events and they've just each time we had 50 people more. And so I'm very pleased with that. And for, and there's also a lot of appetite, which I actually found surprising from partners and sponsors. Like people want to have a virtual booth. People want to like, want to have a virtual panel. They want to put their logo up. They want to be the, the networking partner at a virtual event. Right. So we could, some of that like offline language also tra transitioned tr or translated quite well into the online space. Um, yeah. So do you, no do you, um, know when your next live event's going to be not virtual event, but the actual, uh, yeah. I don't know. The, nobody. Yeah. I, maybe uh, in December, maybe we're going to try a hybrid one, but yeah. It's, uh, I actually don't know. And I think so far in the lo lock industry, hardly anyone has actually kind of gone back to in-person events. I think there's an ALC coming up in Chicago in, in a couple of weeks. Um, so that's, that's quite the domestic audience. That's why they probably can feel comfortable that, you know, people will actually will, will travel because the U S is as domestically is kind of open up, but as a European, you're still not allowed to go to the U S unless you have some compelling reason, et cetera. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe next year. Let's see. Fingers crossed. Well, hey, uh, last question. So um, what's in the pipeline for Slater in your community? 
uh, what's in the pipeline? A uh, complete redesign of the website. So we're really um, uh, kicking this off and hopefully we'll finish it in like Q4, you know, with the, the usual delay, maybe Q1, I don't know. So, you know, just refresh. You need to do that. That's also something I would strongly recommend to every marketer. I mean, just refresh your website all every like three years probably. Because uh, there's, I don't like going on like companies' websites and you're like, well, that's 1998. So <laughs> refresh of the website, uh, you know, much better kind of, customer experience we have a lot more subscribers now than we had like three years ago so like kind of the internal flow of the website etc um and yeah i mean scaling out these these conferences as well so those are two of the bigger uh the bigger priorities and personally you know i'm very busy with the advisory work i i lied i said that was the last question i actually have one more because when you're talking about the website <laughs> i'm actually curious what what metrics do you look at when you talk about a redesign are you looking at speed are you looking at the the, the you, you user experience um yes, that yeah. one okay and how do that you measure one. that how do you measure that um well there's all all kinds of, i mean you can actually really kind of you have you can have heat maps right so you see where people gravitate to first and, and things like that that's quite quite advanced i mean uh for us i hope we get a boost in traffic i mean you know so and and you you convert better so more people that come to your page actually end up buying something so that that's quite quite a hard metric there. So excellent. But it, because like you currently the website has a lot of call to actions and maybe it's almost a little overwhelming. Like if you don't if you go there for the first time, like, well, what what we should I do now? Like buy a press release, read the article, sign up for this or that, right? Uh so we might declutter it a little bit. Well, and that's where I mean some some very large companies are actually using AI um to you know, based upon if this person comes in from this vector, uh, yeah. and then, and lands here and clicks on this, then we're going to feed them this because w there's a high degree of likelihood that this is what they want. Right. Mm. Um, and so, but, um, it sounds like that you're, 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 you're on that track already anyway. Sorry. Yeah. I would, I would, <laughs> maybe, maybe my, my goal is like, let's get a chief marketing officer. No, but, uh, yeah. Um, no, Excellent. it's, it's going to be an exciting time in the next, uh, next few months. Well, hey, Florian, I always appreciate talking to you. Um, I'm super impressed with your success at, at Slater and, uh, and have really enjoyed your, your insights on marketing and wish you the best for the remainder of 2021 and hope to see you in Europe sometime in 2022, man. Please come hey, on. We'll thanks. Go out and do a trail run or something. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Memo All right, take care, man. Thanks, Mark. Cheers, bye. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks.